Joe asked me to, to talk about the Commonwealth and uh, how it relates to, to what we do uh, in the political party, the Libertarian Party of Canada. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about what's been on my mind lately, uh, what I've been thinking about in terms of uh, you know, the trajectory of Western civilization, uh, where we're at, where we're going, uh, what we might be able to do about it. Um, and you know, I, uh, I've, I've been a big fan of J.R. Tolkien, and uh, you know, his leanings, political leanings, are a little bit like mine. Um, in fact, I wear a, a replica of the, the Lord of the Rings Ring of Power on my finger. I got this uh, to remind myself of the power I hold over my children, and uh, the idea Tolkien advances in his epic, the, the Lord of the Rings, is that power can corrupt absolutely and that, that the, uh, the duty of a, a person of good conscience is to try to el eliminate that, uh, that temptation, that power creates, that corrupts. And so I, I wear this to remind myself of the power I have over my kids, but lately I've been wearing it in the political realm. I've been noticing uh, this ring light up from time to time and, and offer certain temptations. And, uh, but, but Tolkien, uh, you know, he, he I, I want to talk a little bit about how it is that this uh, upstanding Englishman, model citizen of the Commonwealth, could have this type of radical idea. You know, he was wrote a letter to his, uh, I believe it was his uh, nephew, talking about how over time he's becoming more and more um, opposed to, to the ruling classes above him. This was the original uh, condensed version of the Libertarian Party platform, probably uh, early 70s in the, in the US, condensed down. You know, it basically says, we favor the abolition of damn near everything regarding government. We call for the drastic reduction in everything else, and we refuse to pay for what's, what's left. Now, this is very attractive to a young rebel like me who is very kind of anti-authoritarian, and you know, I could never understand why my teachers thought you know, that they were smart enough to boss me around and that sort of thing. And I've come to realize over the last few years leading a federal party that I, I only have gotten about half of this right. And uh, you know, the, the libertarian movement and the liberty movement uh, is, is missing part of the picture here. You know, we, we talk all day long about our rights and our liberties and you, you know, don't tread on me. And we never talk about something else. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later on and that's called responsibility. What is it? that I'm responsible for uh, in society. And so th these are the things that I've been thinking about quite a bit lately. But I want to talk a little bit about how we got to this, this place here, because I, I believe that the philosophy my party espouses is deeply rooted in Commonwealth tradition and, and uh, you know, going back to the early, early years of, of England. And I, this is how I think about it, and I'm not a historian, but you know, my, this is how I kind of understand history and the history of the Commonwealth. The, the first notion, I think, of the Commonwealth kind of comes from this idea of the divinity of the individual, and, and that comes, I think, from, from its uh, Christian origins, which, you know, if you remember, Christians were heavily persecuted at, in the, the Roman Empire, in the late Roman Empire. And uh, they, they were partly they, they, they were partly blamed for for the fall of the Roman Empire in the end, and it was because they had very good arguments and rationales to oppose the rule of the Romans, and and that was rooted in the divinity that they had. The you know this idea that you have free will, you are free to sin or you're free to accept salvation. The choice is yours. Salvation can't be imposed on you; it has to be freely accepted. And the idea that Christ inhabits the individual, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is in some sense within you. And so divinity is achieved by the individual. It's not achieved by top-down legislative force. It's not achieved by people imposing their rule on you. You can't impose salvation on someone. And so I think that, that a lot of the, the traditions we see emerge from uh, the English Commonwealth have a lot to do with its, its origins in Christianity and the strong movement there was. And of course, then we get to the Magna Carta. 
And Magna Carta essentially represented one of the first documents that sought to restrict governance and recognized as a corollary uh, the sanctity of the individual. And so it extended fair rule of law for all, or it's, it attempted to uh, protection of property, including women, uh, the right to say how you're governed, and the right to have representation if you're going to have taxation. This idea that if you're going to be taxed, it should be uh, through consent. And you know the, the Magna Carta has been used and, and uh, over the centuries, it's been around for 800 years, it's been used over the centuries as a touchstone to argue for liberty, for individual rights. The next thing that I think is very important that the Commonwealth advanced and, and became very popular uh, under, under the Commonwealth is the idea of the common law. And under the common law, it was very different than the kind of law we might see rising up today, which is legislative law or top-down law. The common law was uh, a body of law. It was, in fact, judges and tribunals and, and courts were, were seeking to do justice by discovering what the law is. So they saw law as this kind of abstract thing to be discovered, and they would, they would uh, arbitrate disputes between two parties and they would try to find the underlying law there and they would, they would base their decisions based on past precedent and over time you saw this body of law emerge, you know, things like the self-defense maxim that you should only use as much force as necessary to stop, uh, to stop an attack, right? And so, you know, if, if you manage to repel a robber out of your house, you don't chase them two blocks and then shoot them in the back kind of thing, right? That would be considered under common law to be not good, but you can use as much force as necessary to repel the attack. That was a, a common law maxim that emerged over time, right? And so I, I liken the common law to, uh, you know, it might be the difference between a capitalist type law, a market of laws versus a socialist kind of top-down law. Or another way of thinking about it is you know, over time the law evolves or it becomes more clear. And so you move from, if you look at science, it might be the idea that you move from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics. But, you know, Einsteinian physics doesn't refute Newtonian physics. It builds on it. It clarifies it. It, it fleshes it out more. And so over time, common law kind of has this quality of fleshing out more clearly what it is that the law, what, what the law is. And one of the, the properties it has is it has this property of certainty or predictability. You know, up until that time, if you had a law, law being legislated by the king, uh, it was very uncertain. A king could pass down a decree at any time, restricting how you can use your property, restricting what you can do in terms of trading with people. So it made life very unpredictable. You couldn't, for example, make investments very easy because you didn't know whether the king would confiscate what you're investing, whether, and so it was a very uncertain legal system. Sounds like Trump. Sounds like Trump. There we go. Yeah, and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll backtrack where we're at today. Uh, you know, I do think we, we've lost that tradition of the common law. Uh, in large part, law now is looked at by most people in society as something written down on paper by by those in authority and kind of handed down to you. And then the judge is no longer concerned with doing justice per se or trying to discover what the law is. He's trying to figure out whether your behavior lines up with what's written down on this piece of paper. And so that, that has had a, a corrupting influence. Another big piece of the puzzle here that I believe uh, makes Western civilization and the Commonwealth so great is property rights. You know, John Locke kind of uh, articulated them uh, in w when he wrote his second tre treatise on government. And basically, every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has a right to but himself. And he, he expounded a little bit on that as well. He said, you know, if you go out in nature and mix your labor with an unowned resource, that's how property is formed. So you go down and chop down some trees and make a log, log cabin, uh, and that's unowned resource when you chop them down. Well, 
uh, no one else can be said to have a property rights claim over that cabin you just built. That's yours. You mixed your labor, your creativity with a virgin resource and you've created property. Now you're free to trade that property. You're free to, to give up your property rights in exchange for money or something else or gift it to your, to your children or your grandchildren. Um, and property rights established a way to peacefully resolve conflicts over scarce resources. Uh, up until that time, you had to appeal to the authority, and the authority would use kind of arbitrary whims to, to, to resolve disputes, or it just resorted to brute force. You know, the law was basically whatever you could take, and whoever was the strongest, uh, who, it was survival of the fittest. And so uh, John, John Locke articulated this. This was a very important thing to articulate because, again, combined with the common law, it created a very uh, stable and uh, predictable way of creating your own destiny, of, of building yourself up, of, of uh, build, picking yourself up out of, out of the, the poverty of your existence and making life better for yourself and your grandkids. And because of that, And because of, of things like goldsmith banking, uh, goldsmith banking was this idea that you um, you would take your money, your gold, you would put it on deposit at a goldsmith, and they would give you a promissory note. And then what would end up happening is people would exchange these promissory notes. It was much easier than hauling around bags of gold all the time, much safer. And then if, if you ever wanted to get your gold back, you would just go to the bank, give them the promissory note, and they would they would give it back to you. And these goldsmiths eventually figured out how to do something called fractional reserve banking, where they would actually loan out uh, or, or print more promissory notes than they actually had uh, gold on reserve. And so that allowed them to extend credit and for people to, to then uh, invest capital and, and, and use that credit and those loans to build things. Uh, you know, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that has been maybe corrupted and what we can do about that. But, but all these things, property rights, common law, um, you know, the ability to, to uh, have money in the hands of the people, I would argue, set up the, the conditions for the Industrial Revolution. And you know, the, the Industrial Revolution gets a bad rap, doesn't it? I mean, I, I did some work with uh, Neil Young and Daryl Hannah when they came up to Fort McMurray uh, a few years ago. And, they wanted to make an environmental film, and I was happy to help them. I wanted to show them a different side that they might not have thought of, the environmental consciousness that was kind of, uh, had arisen in my community of Fort McMurray. So here we have a community of people who have come from all over Canada, all over the world, to dig in the dirt and be productive and create a product that was useful for the world, produce energy for the world, and Amazingly, here we had the, the, the weekend that Neil Young came to town, this eco-carnival. So it was a carnival uh, with a Ferris wheel and, and you know all these games for the kids. And it was run off used cooking oil from local restaurants. It had a solar-powered stage. I, I thought, Neil, wouldn't it be great if you sat, got up on this solar-powered stage in the heart of dirty oil sands country? And, sang a song, right? Here's, here's where we're at, here's where we're going, right? We're going th this direction because of the wealth that the Industrial Revolution created. And the irony is, you know, he went, he went to Washington, D.C. the next week and he, uh, he blasted the, the oil sands and said that, uh, you know, we were committing genocide and that we look like Hiroshima. He used all this kind of apocalyptic language to describe my, the community I loved. It, it irritated me to say, the least, and I wrote an article that went viral, and that in, in large part actually springboarded my, uh, my political career. But the irony here is that it, his son, his 36-year-old son who had bad cystic fibrosis, who was given a life expectancy of a, about 16 years when he lived, uh, here's a man who is able to play guitar, to make music all day long. He doesn't have to go out and chop down trees and till the soil and, and work dusk till dawn and, and slave. And his child doesn't have to be sentenced to death, essentially, precisely because of a sequence of chain of events that leads back to that industrial revolution, creating more flourishing, creating more prosperity uh, for, for humans. And so he's, 
you know, to my mind, undermining the very thing that gives his son the ability to live to 36 and gives him the ability to make a, uh, a, a great career flying around the world, um, acting sanctimonious and pompous in my estimation. The other thing that, that I'm very proud about the Commonwealth for doing is being one of the first countries to abolish slavery. Um, you know, the, the abolition of slavery, we often get a bad rap as Commonwealth nations or as North Americans or as white people for institutionalizing slavery. Um, but I don't think anyone ever tells the story about how it was abolished uh, in the Commonwealth. And, and the abolition of slavery was in part because of the Christian conscience, but it was also in part because of all these steps that had happened up to that point. The idea of the sanctity and the divinity of the individual and that that shouldn't be infringed on. And that led people of good conscience to understand that what they were doing was wrong and to correct it. And so uh, that's something that I think the Commonwealth should be very proud about. This is a World War II uh, poster. And, and I think it speaks to this idea that uh, of e pluribus unum, right? Or put another way, multiculturalism done correctly. Um, you know, today multiculturalism looks a little bit different. It looks like, uh, you know, government importing and managing migration and siloing people off into separate communities. You know, uh, out of many, one has now become out of many, many uh, in conflict with each other. But that ideal, I think, is still worth striving for. The idea that under the, under the banner of liberty that has been established by the Commonwealth, where I'm not allowed to impose my will on you or my beliefs on you, um, we can live harmoniously. We can have our own beliefs, our own uh, religions in the, in the sanctity of our home, and we can live in peace because we are all bound under this substrate of liberty, and we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have to, an agenda to push. That, that, I think, is uh, something, again, we're missing these days. And the other thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is this idea of, of a higher ideal, right? So, you know, it's not the person, Queen Elizabeth, that, uh, th that necessarily holds up the standard of, of the crown. It's, it's the office of the crown. It's what that represents. And it might represent something a little bit different for each of us. You know, to me, it, it represents the idea of servant leadership, of uh, fidelity to a higher standard, of honor, um, of this idea that there's something bigger than myself in this world that I need to be faithful to. And I think that is, is you know, for a long time as, as, as a kind of rebellious libertarian, I looked at the crown as kind of a, um, you know, what, why do I have this old lady ruling over me? Uh, what right does she have? And, and I shook my fist. But uh, I, I've come to think of it in a much different way now, right? It's, it's, uh, it's an ideal that we ought to strive for, this idea of honor, loyalty, fidelity to a higher purpose, um, that we're all in this together. It's a symbolic figure that we focus on that kind of binds us together. And so, How do we avoid this? Because all of many of these things that we, that we talk about that I've just discussed here were also characteristics of the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire fell. And how did it fall? And, and what lessons can we learn from that? Uh, is there any danger for us? What, what do you guys think? Do, do you sense any danger? Am, am I the only one here that is worried about the direction of Western civilization? Oh, okay, good. Well, I'm glad I'm, glad I'm not uh, thinking out, you know, crazy here. But, but this is where it seems, you know, it seems we're at a nexus. There's tremendous opportunity, but there's also a looming danger. And so if, if I'm going to go back in order here and, and deconstruct what causes civilizations like the Roman Empire to fall and what could cause civilizations like Western civilization to fall, I would just have to go backwards through my, my slides. No more higher ideal, right? It's all every man for himself. What, it's not about what I owe the greater good. It's what the greater good owes me. 
Um, and, and this is a problem, right? So, so how do we get back to uh, you know, giving, giving young brash guys like me a reason to believe in that higher power? What are, what are the good reasons to believe in that? that that's, I believe, the challenge that we face now. And, I, and I'm grateful for uh, you know, the Royal Commonwealth Society because I believe you're, you're filling an important role here in connecting people with the reasons for that higher idea. Why is tradition important? Well, I'm only just discovering this now in my early 40s. Why didn't I discover this sooner? Why, why was this story never told to me in a way that, that appealed to me or that I could understand or could wrap my head around? That's, that's the challenge. E pluribus unum has been corrupted to, to mean e pluribus pluribus, right? I mean, we're, it's no longer one voice under liberty. It's, it's many voices with competing rights and oppressed classes of people. It's a competition to see who's the biggest victim, who's the most oppressed. And, uh, and so this idea that, that we're one nation or one uh, commonwealth has been lost. The Industrial Revolution, you know, the, the, um, the, this idea that, that CO2 emissions are going to create catastrophe, that we need global socialization to stave off this catastrophe are both very extraordinary claims. Um, you know, 97% of scientists seem to agree that the Earth is warming and that men are the cause of that. But no one has produced any evidence about whether this on whole is good, bad, indifferent. I mean, it's going to be good for Canada. We know that, uh, uh, you know, as the earth warms, the, the equatorial region warms at a much slower rate than the northern region. So that means we're going to have lots of arable land. That means that the majority of Can Canadians who live within a couple hundred kilometers of the U.S. border can now start migrating further northward and finding more prosperity. Uh, that seems like a good thing to me. We're going to have more plants. That also seems like a good thing to me. Uh, so it's not at all clear to me why we need to restrict, control, and redistribute wealth um, and, and how that's going to stave off catastrophe. That seems like a catastrophe waiting to happen to me. It seems like the undermining of the very thing that brought us to the dance, that created wealth, health, uh, longevity. Uh, flourishing, the ability to sit here and pontificate rather than be toiling out in the field right now. And that very thing seems to be under attack. You know, th this idea that people control the money is no longer here. Now we have central banking cartels bolstered with power from the state, uh, centrally managing money. And if you want to talk about an underlying reason why society is so hedonistic these days, why we're so driven to consume, 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 and not save and invest for the future and build up uh, capital investment. You, you have no further to look than the incentives that uh, centralized banking, uh, government controlled centralized banking sets up. Property rights. Does anyone even know what property rights mean anymore? Well, you do. I, I think probably most of the people here do, but I, I wonder if society at large understands what it means. It seems like these are, um, I mean, they're certainly not in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, are they? Uh, it seems like that would be a very important one since almost all other human rights flow from property rights. You know, the right to free speech says that you can't lay your mitts on me for what I'm, I'm saying, but it also means, property rights also mean that, that I don't have to tolerate you putting down my wife at my kitchen table. Um, and so even, even the, this idea of free speech and being able to talk to each other, no one really understands that that's rooted in property rights. And, and um, the, the, they're constantly under attack, right? Uh, you became wealthy, not because of what you did, but because of the, what, what the government did for you. Uh, this was a speech by, I think it was either Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, right? You didn't create the wealth, um, the government created that wealth. Well, I take exception to that. That's just not true. It was, it was definitely a group of people that created the wealth. It was a division of labor. It was uh, the free market. But it wasn't government. Government gets in the way of that. And uh, you know, this continually asking the government to fix all our problems and solve everything, it's, it's, it's no longer seen as, as a, 
you know, as Churchill called it, uh, a necessary evil. It's now considered a virtue, uh, a committee of virtue. You go to the committee of virtue if you ever have any any desires, any, you know, you need a safe space, government will provide it for you. You, you want a free education, government will provide it for you. Well, of course, we all know that it's not the government providing those things, it's productive class of people that are taxed by the government providing those things. And, uh, and that's largely because we don't respect other people's property. And property includes the money you earn, it includes uh, the possessions you obtain, it includes the capital you create. So. Um, it's a troubling trend. Common law has now been largely replaced by legislative law, right? I mean, uh, political talk now is all about arguing about what legislation the government ought to pass. Well, I, I believe in markets, and this is what created, I believe, uh, a flourishing commonwealth, allow, allowed the commonwealth to spread, allowed these ideas to, to, to travel around the world and become embraced by, by millions and billions of people. And uh, we're, we're losing that, right? Because it, it is now seen as, um, as government legislating. Uh, so, you know, if, if there's a problem, uh, a dispute to be resolved, people don't talk about, well, how might a judge resolve that dispute? They talk about what law should government pass to avoid that ever happening again. And so, you know, dispute resolution is a very complex problem, and each case is individual and needs to be weighed in context, and principles need to be referred to, otherwise known as the law. And uh, to simply legislate that all disputes in this general category shall be arbitrated this way, and this shall be the, the prison sentence or the remedy uh, for these disputes, well, that, that is a corruption of the, the British common law system. We've lost our respect for the Constitution as well, I believe. You know, having a paper that, ha having a doctrine that we see as sacrosanct, as the, the principles that hold our nation, our civilization together, is, that's just no longer the case. The Constitution in the U.S., the Constitution in Canada is under constant attack. Uh, you know, in Canada we have comedians being fined by human rights tribunals, for, for things they say on a stage. Um, you know, we, we see, uh, for example, a, a Muslim hairdresser get taken to the Human Rights Tribunal because uh, a lesbian uh, woman, because he refuses to cut a lesbian woman's hair. It's against his religion to cut her hair. He doesn't want to be forced to cut her hair. But she takes offense to that, takes them to the Human Rights Tribunal and wins a settlement. And these are the kinds of things that are continually happening in Canada today. And it's because we have no strong respect for the Constitution. It's being constantly weighed with some, something else called uh, the public interest. And, you know, I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, I, I am an atheist. But there's a real problem with atheism, and that is that uh, the large majority of atheists tend to replace worship of God with worship of the state. And, uh, you know, they, they essentially pray to the state and ask the state to solve all their problems. You know, we, we see this go hand in hand with the rise of communism. And it, it seems like um, this radical leftist, r radical leftism, uh, where the state replaces God is becoming a real problem. And so the challenge, I think, going forward is, is how do we reinstill that faith again in that higher power, that thing that is greater than yourself as an individual. And, and these are the things that I'm, I'm thinking about now. And I, I don't have all the answer, but I'll tell you some of the things that I've come up with for myself personally. And you tell me if they resonate with you. Maybe you can give me some ideas uh, after I talk about this. But I think the first thing that I have to do is, is look in the mirror. I have to look at the principles that I'm preaching out in the world. This idea that I shouldn't trample on, uh, that, that no one should trample on my rights. And I have to look at how am I trampling on the people around me? How am I trampling on my children? How am I trampling on my wife? How am I trampling on my coworkers? Um, if, if I'm going to be espousing these principles, I better be preaching them or practicing them. And, uh, you know, I think that we, we oftentimes lose sight of the, that fact. I want to be solution oriented. So it, it's not, it, I, I think it creates a problem fixation. If we're constantly looking at all the problems in the world and saying, 
that's a problem we got to fix, that's a problem we got to fix, that's a problem we got to fix. Um, we, we don't engage the creative mentality that creates solutions. And so what I want to do going forward is look at what's working in the world, what's alive, where is life and flourishing emerging from, and how do we nourish that, how do we encourage that. I think that um, we need to understand that, that we're all in this together. And so rather than looking at differences, libertarians are very good at this amongst each other. We focus on the 2% of the areas we disagree on and we fixate on that. And we, we point out where you're wrong. You are wrong, brother. You can't be in the group. You, you know, this isn't right. Um, we ignore the 95% of the areas we agree on. And this is true of everyone. I don't care if you're on the left, the right, or, or some other, you know, we, we're all struggling to do our best in this world. And we all want to see the same type of result. We want to see more flourishing. We want to see longer life. We want to see more wealth and happiness. Uh, and we don't want people to be marginalized. And we don't want to see uh, downtrodden souls. We, we want to lift up our, you know, see people lifted up around us. And I, I believe that's true of everyone. Uh, and, and so I think it's important to leverage common ground. And I also think it's important not to constantly catastrophize and say, well, one day, uh, if, it, if it all doesn't go to heck, uh, there, there'll be a, a libertopia or some future Canada that is wonderful and all roses. I think that's, that's a fiction. I think that the process of liberty, of establishing nationhood, and and uh, flourishing, these are things that are a constant process. They're a constant struggle. We need to, to constantly be vigilant. And again, it starts in the mirror and it works outward from there. And I don't think it can work any other way. I don't think that petitioning government, for example, I don't think that if, if I were to form a majority government tomorrow, I would be able to make much of a difference. It, the government is a byproduct of the culture. It's a byproduct of the belief system of people in this room and of people in this nation. And so if this, people in this nation um, want big government, if they want, um, you know, all these, if they want the, the industrial revolution undermined, if they, they don't care about property rights, well, our society is doomed no matter what government we elect. And so my goal is to connect with hearts and minds one conversation at a time. And that's the only way I think we save Western civilization. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as winning an election and passing some laws. I wish it were, um, but that is my take on it. And I see that we're right out, out of time here. I'm happy to take any questions or comments or suggestions about how you guys think about this, but uh, Thank you.